Apple released a couple of new MacBooks in 2024. Early in the year, we saw a new MacBook Air with an M3 come out, and more recently, the new MacBook Pros with M4 chips. And although quite a lot stayed the same between each model compared to their predecessors, just as much, if not more, changed. The M3 chipset in the Air saw an increase in performance over the M2, specifically on the GPU. The MacBook Pro with the M4 chipset added more cores, new port specs, and saw some pretty big gains in performance itself. And on top of that, Apple gave us a little boost to the overall value of these machines with a slight spec bump at no extra cost. I've been lucky enough to have tested out not just these new machines, but the ones that came before them, and used all of them in my daily workflow. And today, I want to get into what the last year has been like on these machines, what's been great, and what could be improved. So if you want to know more about what you can expect to get out of these machines long term, or maybe you're considering buying one of these and you're just looking for more information, stick around and let's get into it. Hey everyone, Kyle Erickson here. We're right at the end of 2024 and it's around that time of year where we tend to reflect on what the year has looked like. And one of my favorite things to do on the channel is look at that in the context of the products that I've looked at. Last week I went over the desktop Macs that I've used this year so I wanted to follow that up with all the MacBooks that I've tried because these are the machines that I've used the most over the last year, and it's my second year being able to buy all of these and test them out, so I'm hoping that my experience can translate into some value for anyone out there who is looking for more information on these. We should probably start out with what I was using at the beginning of 2024, which at that time was the newly released MacBook Pro with the M3 Pro. That was the Mac that I used the most out of any other this year, and I originally planned on just using it as a review unit, but because the performance felt so similar to the M2 Max Mac Studio that I was using at the time, just in terms of what I use my Mac for, I decided it would probably be more valuable to use it long term and report back on what I found three or four months later so I could give a more informed opinion on it. That MacBook was the base 14 inch M3 Pro machine, so it came with an 11 core CPU, 14 core GPU, 18 gigs of RAM, and a 512 gig SSD, and was priced at $19.99 USD. And there were some notable upgrades and downgrades compared to the M2 Pro. First off, for whatever reason, the memory bandwidth dropped down to 150 gigabytes per second, where the previous version was 200, which isn't something that you'll generally notice, but I still think is worth mentioning. But the bigger downgrade and probably most noteworthy was that the amount of performance cores on the base M3 Pro dropped down to five from six on the previous generation. That resulted in a lot of people who do audio work and DAWs having worse performance, but it did get better over time. And in my own experience, I found it to perform much better than the M2 Pro on multiple fronts. For starters, I saw about a 17-18% to 18 increase in performance over the M2 Pro in terms of CPU benchmarks, which normally isn't perceivable when you're actually using the thing. For me, if I was editing photos, doing graphic design, coding, or making these videos, there wasn't a ton of difference and I could do any of those things on either machine no problem. I also rarely ran into any out of memory warnings on the M3 Pro despite it only having 18 gigs of RAM, unless there was a memory leak or something was wrong with an app I was using, and I would say most of the Pro M series Macs have felt very similar for nearly all CPU related tasks, but when it comes to the GPU, that's where the M3 Pro took a big leap forward. This was the first generation where Apple introduced dynamic caching and hardware accelerated ray tracing on the GPU, and that's made a huge difference in any apps or games that took advantage of ray tracing. For instance, in Blender with Metal RT on, you see almost twice the performance going from the M2 Pro to the M3 Pro, and that was almost instantly noticeable. Render times were much faster, and everything just felt snappier. Outside of that, the battery life was a little bit better as well, which likely had to do with utilizing less performance cores, and also the fact that the M3 series chips moved to a 3 nanometer process from 5 in the M2 series. 
That essentially means the components in the chips are much smaller and can often translate into better power efficiency. And I think initially when I was keeping track of battery life, or something like a 20% improvement over the M2 Pro, give or take. And I had no problem getting a full day of use on a single charge. There were some other minor improvements that I generally didn't notice in practical use, like SSD speed, but all in all, performance-wise, this was a very solid MacBook for me. When it came to the design, that stayed largely the same, other than the new space black color offered, which did hold up very well. I saw some light wear around the USB-C ports, but that was barely visible, and the display was fantastic, with the same mini LED ProMotion XDR panel that was a little bit brighter than the previous gen specs-wise, but nothing that was perceivable just by looking at it. Now, I used this all the way up to the end of October and really enjoyed it, but I did step away from it for about three months when the new 13-inch M3 MacBook Air came out in March. Again, I transferred my entire workflow over to that machine for the full three months, and just like going from the M2 Pro to the M3 Pro, going from the M2 Air to the M3 Air saw similar results where you saw about a 20% increase in overall CPU performance, but could get up to twice the performance on the GPU with the introduction of hardware-enabled ray tracing. Surprisingly enough, the M3 Air ran my entire workflow without any issues, even though it was a tad slower at times with a bit less powerful chip than the M3 Pro and having no fan, which on occasion would throttle performance, but by and large, most things felt almost indistinguishable from the M3 Pro. It was really only when I'd get into resource-heavy plugins with video editing or anything where I was really leaning into the GPU that the M3 Air felt like it would start bogging down, but even still, gaming on here worked well as long as you turned down the settings a little, but if I was doing any kind of 3D work with heavier scenes and things of that nature, I'd definitely be reaching for my Pro Machine a lot, but just used in more of a casual manner, the M3 Air was still incredibly powerful. I also found the Air much easier to pack around with me and travel with. It might not seem like a huge difference versus the 14-inch MacBook Pro only being 0.8 pounds lighter and 4.2 millimeters thinner, but it's definitely noticeable, and although it's only got two ports, I'd still rather bring this with me on trips versus the Pro model. Even the display on here, while it's not as good as the mini LED ProMotion XDR panel in the MacBook Pros, still has a 1400 to 1 contrast ratio, which is outstanding for an IPS panel, and you still get the same great color accuracy you do on all of Apple's displays, so there is a lot to like about it. On top of that, you get great battery life that will easily last you a full day, and one side benefit that you have to all the new Macs released this fall and the launch of Apple Intelligence is that Apple dropped the price of the Air and the minimum spec on these now has 16 gigs of RAM instead of 8 at no added cost, which is always nice. That being said, it probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense to buy one of these right now unless you really need one, as there's likely an M4 Air right around the corner, but regardless, I still think that most people would be very happy with the M3 Air. The last machine I used in 2024 was the newest M4 Pro MacBook Pro that was announced at the end of October, and to be honest, I've been using that in more of a supplemental role, with my main Mac being the new M4 Pro Mac Mini, but there is a lot that's new on the MacBook Pro and some differences between it and the Mac Mini that I have that are somewhat interesting as well. First off, this again has roughly the same design as the last few generations of the 14-inch Pro machines. It's got the same form factor, same color options, but the display will get a touch brighter than the M3 Pro outdoors, going up to 1000 nits, where Previously, it would top out at 600, but in my experience, you rarely ever see it reach past 600. The panel type is also a little different as well, as the M4 Pro MacBook Pros use a quantum dot layer on their displays that are supposed to give them a bit more pop, but I find it indistinguishable side by side with the M3 Pro model, and it's really on the inside of the machine, where you're going to see any practical differences over the last generation. This again is the base MacBook Pro with the M4 Pro, so you get a 12 core CPU and a 16 core GPU with 24 gigs of RAM and a 512 gig. SSD. And the big difference here is not only with a bump in memory and the amount of cores, but 
the types of cores as well. Unlike the M3 Pro that went backwards with the amount of performance cores, this jumped all the way up to eight performance cores. And on top of that, the memory bandwidth also went up to 273 gigabytes per second, which is almost twice the speed of the M3 Pro. You certainly see that reflected in benchmarks where you see anywhere between 18 to 29% better CPU scores and close to 30% better GPU benchmarks which carries over to real world use as well, where you'll see much better performance in apps like Blender and better compile times while coding. I think I said this in another video, but to me, these M4 Pro machines feel like what the M3 Pro should have been. Beyond that, even the port specs are better with the introduction of Thunderbolt 5, where you can get up to an 80 gigabit per second data transfer speed, which is twice as fast as Thunderbolt 4, or up to 120 gigabits in some instances, if you're powering an external display. I've tested this with a Thunderbolt 5 SSD enclosure, and that, combined with the better specs on the machine, do make a perceivable difference in my workflow, where if I'm video editing and I've got media on an external drive, everything loads faster, is snappier scrubbing my timeline when editing, and videos export faster as well, which has been a pleasant surprise. That being said, my experience hasn't been great with Thunderbolt 5 accessories at this point, and they are pretty scarce to begin with, but that external enclosure does run fairly hot, and some of the hubs that I've tried have been pretty underwhelming, so I'd say if you're buying this for Thunderbolt 5, it's likely going to be more about future-proofing yourself right now more than anything, and I'm sure better products will become available. I'm just not quite sure that we're there yet. Also, if you're wondering if it's worth bumping up the M4 Pro chip on here to the non-binned 14-core version with a 20-core GPU, that is what I have on my M4 Pro Mac Mini, and I honestly don't notice a huge difference there. At least not much with anything that's heavily CPU based and maybe a little bit more on the GPU with things like 3D worker gaming, but I think if you're really planning on stepping that up, the most logical step would be to the M4 Max, and frankly, I just don't really have a need for that chip. The only thing that's been somewhat of a downside is the M4 Pro MacBook Pro does warm up a little bit faster than its predecessor, and because it is running more performance cores, when you start to tax the system, the battery life isn't quite as good as the M3 Pro version, but on the flip side, it will last a little bit longer with light use only. When it comes down to it, I've been able to do pretty much anything that I've wanted to on the M4 Pro, and really all these machines with very few issues. Sure, there are instances where you'll notice the extra power in the Pro machines, and they obviously come with the added benefits like the ProMotion display and the added ports and things of that nature, but my experience in 2024, regardless of which Mac I've used, has been overwhelmingly positive. I will say, if you're more of a casual user and you're not touching anything too crazy, maybe you're working on some medium-sized software projects or you're doing some photo editing or lighter video editing, the Air will do you just fine, but anything more than that, it's probably worth reaching for a Pro chip. It really boils down to preference and what you're looking to get out of a machine. And just remember that if you buy from Apple, you've got two weeks to try something out. And if you don't like it or it's not gonna work, you can always return it and pick up something else. I will be continuing to use these M4 machines and I will have some long-term reviews on these in the new year. I'm really looking forward to 2025 and I've got some great stuff planned, but 2024 has been incredible. Just the amount that the channel has grown is really hard for me to fathom. So I just wanna take a moment and thank all of you for supporting the channel because none of this would be possible without you. And I sort of have some ideas on how I can give back at least a little bit, but I want to make sure that that's entirely about you guys and not about me. So stay tuned for that, but that's all I have for you. All the best in 2025 and I'll see you next year.